Welcome to Thomas Persons Hall. This is Robert Jordan. I'm going to be recording the Seven Islands Road presentation tonight. Um, the Thomas Persons Hall building in Monticello was the high school for many years and it's been recently remodeled and a big part of the funding for the remodeling came through a Georgia DOT grant that was tied to the Seven Islands Road. The new building or newly remodeled building will house the Seven Islands Road Museum, uh, among many other things, to be used by the community. So this is a story uh, that began a long time ago and hopefully has a future as well as we study and, and continue to learn about the Seven Islands Road and the stagecoach route that accompanied it. So I'm going to go through. Um, I'm Robert Jordan. I'm a surveyor from Monticello. And I originally got involved and interested in the Seven Islands Road because I tried to link landlot maps that were created in the early 1800s to today's modern road maps so I could kind of tie everything together. And I realized that there were some old roads and paths shown on these old maps from 1803. So I traced those across the modern road map. When our Chamber of Commerce kind of learned that I had done that, they started sending people my way that were coming into town asking about Seven Islands, Stagecoach Road, and, and Indian Path, Native American Trail. So I, over the years, talked to a lot of people who were interested in this uh, topic, so I learned more about it. And then a couple of months ago, Sissy Benton asked me to give a presentation, and I've really crammed in the last couple of months and learned a lot more about the trail. I've done a lot more recon. I've learned the locations and so forth. So um, I've got a lot to talk about and it's probably going to go a little over an hour, but hope you enjoy it. The talk that is given at Thomas Persons Hall in September of 2018, uh, I was accompanied or will be accompanied by Benny Hawthorne, who is a local historian uh, and photographer and generally enthusiastic person about Jasper County, but I'll be doing this narration by myself because Benny is not here. So I hope you enjoy it, and uh, here we go. To gain uh, a real appreciation for a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, you need perspective, and the best way to get perspective is to learn about the the people and things that happened around uh, the trail learn its prehistory, what happened and how it started before the arrival of uh, settlers from Europe into North America and they began writing things down. And then the, the, the history region when things started to be writing, writing, written down and, and find out um, what people have written and said about the trail. Uh, so we'll go through the prehistory first, then I'll run through the history uh, in a general, general sense of this area of Georgia as related to the trail. And then we'll get into the section uh, where I'll be talking about routes. We'll talk about Native American paths and stagecoach routes in middle Georgia, specifically around Jasper County. And then we'll talk about road hunting tools, which is sort of the, what I've titled the topic where I talk about how I go out and look for these roads and remnants and, and what I use to help me find uh, old evidence of the roads. And then finally, I'll take a virtual stagecoach tour across the county from northeast to southwest. And in our presentation at Thomas Persons Hall, I was sort of the play-by-play -play guy and stagecoach driver, and Benny Hawthorne was the color commentator uh, and tour guide as we stopped and looked at various items along the route. Tonight I'll play both roles, so I'll be doing uh, all the talking. And um, so we'll start with the pre- Before the Europeans. We're going to start from the very beginning on this story uh, with a little micro-geology lesson. Long time ago, 600 million years probably, there was an ocean in this area, sediment, and little creatures and all sorts of things settled out of the water and into layers on the bottom of that ocean. Over years, lots of heat and pressure uh, created rocks out of those sediments. 
layered rocks. Then about 300 million years ago, uh, heat and magma from inside the earth caused pressure under those layers. It tilted them up and cracked them in lots of locations. And uh, the tilt of the rocks as, the, as they were tilted up and to allow the magma to flow through is the dip. That's the angle. Uh, the strike is the direction of the ends of the rock along the surface of the earth as, as they're usually exposed lengthwise to the earth. And this will play a big part later on uh, because this event that happens 600 million and 300 million years ago, these events um, eventually caused these east-west rows of exposed rocks that the Ogmogi River, which formed later, uh, could not basically could not dig a channel through. So it had to spread out wide when it crossed these rocks. And that created a shallow river with a lot of exposed rocks that were little stepping stones that people could walk across. And everything we're talking about tonight was born of those events over millions of years. And you'll see later how that comes. The first paths in the southeastern U.S. were created by people that came across from Northeast Asia and Siberia um, at the end of the last ice age. And I think that was 16 or 17 or 18,000 years ago. And pretty quickly, those people expanded throughout North America and South America and started making tools and establishing settlements that were found recently by archeologists. Some of the most ancient sites in North America are right around the Savannah River. There's one called Topper just over in South Carolina that's reportedly found tools that are 16,000 years old. Just south of here in Macon, there's a site called Ogmogi Old Fields. That's probably the most well-known nearby ancient site uh, of Native, Native American population. It's been inhabited for over 12,000 years. The Native Americans in that area went through a, what's called a paleo tradition or culture and then into a woodlands tradition over several thousand years. And a couple thousand years ago, most Native American populations in this area of the country uh, developed a Mississippian tradition where they built mounds for worship and other purposes. And, and the site in Macon has lots of uh, really well um, preserved mounds t to see and it, it's, a, it's an interest, interesting spot to visit. Pretty recently in the 16th and 19th centuries and, um, and thereabouts, the Creek and Cherokee confederacies formed. And I'll talk more later about how they came to be and, and why they didn't happen until relatively recently by, by um, standards of the history I'm giving now. So why do we have these paths and, and who formed them and how? The agricultural economy, if you will, culture, didn't form in, in North America until 2,500 years ago or so. Before that time, the population primarily was migratory, hunting, fishing, uh, gathering, and they probably moved from place to place throughout the year the seasons maybe you know certain berries were available in certain areas of the state at different times and game moved around at different times so they primarily weren't really moving point to point as much as just migrating uh, throughout the year or throughout the seasons and then when agriculture took hold a couple of thousand years ago people started staying in one place a lot more and gathering in larger population centers little villages and towns and so the trails that were formed by these folks weren't as much migratory at that point as as point to point roads from town to town and uh, population centers and also war paths you've heard that term and it is literal in this case they use these paths to go to defend one side of their territory or to attack another tribe so that was another uh, use that was probably made of these paths. The paths I'll mention were a little bit less important south of the fall line in Georgia because down there you have broader, flatter rivers that are very conducive to canoe traffic. So there were still some paths, but 
they they played less of a role in commerce and, and daily life. Most historians that I've read uh, describe the very early paths as braided ways. They were corridors um, that contained multiple routes. Sometimes uh, some of them were easier to walk than others. And if you know if you're a 22 year old brave uh, traveling on your own and you maybe you were in a hurry, didn't have a, a lot of uh, pack on your back. Maybe you took the steeper hills and the tougher creek crossings, and maybe there's you know there's some traffic on on that type of trail. Whereas if you were with your elderly um, kinfolk and and carrying a, a baby and a bunch of um, material with you, maybe you took an easier path around um, the head of a spring or uh, around a, 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 a steeper hillside, so that your route was a little longer, but it was a little easier. So. You had multiple paths at one time, probably, and then you also had situations where paths moved. I mean, even if something as small as a big oak tree falling across a path, you know, they, they didn't have blades and steel, and they weren't going to cut a 36-inch oak off the trail, so they just moved the path. So they were they were dynamic, and they were not one single two-foot-wide path forever. They, they they were variable. There were no wheeled vehicles before um, white settlers arrived and no horses or beast of burden. The last camel probably existed about six or 8,000 years ago in North America. So all of the land disturbance before the 15th century was just by people's feet. Very little erosion because people's feet don't disturb the earth that much and soil particles don't move around. So today when we find remnants of these old roads, we're not finding remnants of the original paths. Uh, in many cases, if at all, we're finding roads that evolved from the paths. When the very early settlers arrived, they they started to use these paths because they were the easiest way to get their crops to market and so forth. So we're finding the result, the remnants of what the what later wagons and beasts created, not the original trails. When I started researching how they might have marked these trails, you know, the first thing you find on the internet when you when you research trail markers is, is all these bent trees. And I'm sure that there was some tree bending uh, by Native Americans to mark trails. It might have even been very prevalent. But I'm guessing 90% of the trail markers that people post today as being Indian trees are just nothing more than accidents of nature where a tree accidentally got leaned over when it was young. I found these two when I was looking for some of these road remnants and they're far, far too young to be um, anything like Indian markers. They're just, um, they're just bent over trees. However, uh, Catesby, who, who's a naturalist uh, studying this area in the 1730s wrote that the Indians would leave certain marks in the way where they that come after will understand how many have passed and which way they have gone. So they, they had some way of marking these trails and maybe even naming them, even though they didn't have a written language. De Brom, who is an early surveyor, found hieroglyphics in red and black on the trees along Indian Pass. He said they were executed like the Egyptian art on coffins of the mummies. If that's true, they were some pretty ornate markings and it would have been very interesting to see what they looked like. But I don't think there was any record of those, at least that level of ornate. So that's that's a snapshot of the people and the time that these uh, paths were created. Obviously, we don't know a lot about it. Um, archaeologists, I'm sure, know a lot more than what I've just told you. But beginning in the 16th century, we started start to have a written history, and so we we begin to learn a lot more uh, facts about what happened and, and how the trails were were formed and 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 how they moved. That's what we're going to talk about now. In the 16th century. Um, Native Americans were uh, obviously oblivious to society elsewhere in the world and they, were, they had an agriculture of corn, beans, and squash that was making their, making their economy. And there was about 8 to 12 million uh, Native American population in North America based on my research and that's about the same number of people in Georgia today. It's also about the same number of people that were in France at that time, uh, you know, pre-Columbus. 
So it was not a desolate place. There were a lot of people here. They were spread out a lot more uh, probably than they are now. And um, they lived a very different lifestyle than we live. But there was, it, was, it was pretty crowded. It was not a desolate place. Some of the tribes that existed in Georgia, um, the Appalachian, Choctaw, Hitchiti, Oconee, Miccosukee, Muskogee, Timakiwa, Yamasee, Gwali, and Yuki. Hope, hopefully I've mispronounced those properly. Those are names you've probably heard of before. And Georgia has, I've read, the largest number of Native American place names of any state in the Union. So we get, we get used to hearing these names, but these were some of the primary tribes located in this area. And the chief was always male, but his position was inherited matrilinear, matrilineally through his mother. And uh, it was interesting the way it happened. If a woman was holder of the, the line of chiefdom, her son would become chief and her daughter would, would be the carrier of the lineage. And then when her daughter had, say, a son and a daughter, her daughter's son would be the next chief and her daughter's daughter would carry the lineage. So the chiefs moved from uncle to nephew on down the line like that. And if, if you want to have a fun exercise, take your family tree and go back as far as, as you can and see and just you know, pick a, a a female that might have carried the lineage, and and trace it down, and see who would have been the chiefs in your in your family, and see who would have carried the lineage. It's kind of an interesting exercise that was. In the 16th century, Hernando de Soto landed on the west coast of Florida. He had 600 men and 250 horses, so it was a pretty big expedition from Spain, obviously, uh, and he came up through Florida. Traveled probably on some of the uh, some of the roads that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Came through Macon up toward Augusta. You can see how he looped around Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas. I think he died in Louisiana, and I think uh, roughly half of his his expedition was dead before it was over. But he had a lot more with him than 600 men and 250 horses that affected our story, and he didn't know it at the time. But he was probably the last. European expedition to ever see what the culture and the people of the Southeast really looked like because with him were billions of microbes from that were established in the big cities in Europe they were carrying you know they were disease microbes and and the Native Americans didn't have any um, way of fending them, these off so tuberculosis cholera these other diseases probably wiped out about 90% of the population because there was no immunity. And what was left of these roughly 12 chiefdoms coagulated together into the Creek and Cherokee confedera confederations, I think I've heard them called. And they were primarily, um, they grouped together based on language. The Muscogan language was the Creek language. I'm not sure what the Cherokees spoke. In the 17th century, there was maps showing Creek Indians living around Indian Springs and the upper Ogmogee River, probably near Lloyd Shoals and Seven Islands, 40-acre island. The early fur traders, who were primarily trading from the coast of South Carolina in that area, westward into Indian Territory, into Alabama and Georgia, uh, they called the crossings and the path Seven Islands of the Ogmogee. So, Way back then, that, 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 that name was, was written and that path, which was probably the, the same path as the Upper Creek Trail, was called the Seven Islands Trail, Seven Islands Crossing. And when Charleston was formed in 1670, um, they started calling it the Oak Fusky Path. There was a town on the Tallapoosa River over in Alabama, East Alabama, um, where a lot of traders would congregate and gather their pelts and deer skins and then carry them along the Upper Creek Trail eastward to Charleston, probably to put on ships and take to the northern U.S. or to Europe for sale. And that path was a, a very important part of the very early North American economy. And it went right through uh, Jasper County between Hillsborough and Monticello. So we, um, we were home to not only one path, but quite a few. 
the upper creek uh, path is the one I just described uh, that was called Oak Fusky. In the 18th century, there was a small war. The Cherokees and the South Carolina colonists teamed up against their enemy, the Creeks, and drove a lot of the Creeks out of the area where we are, uh, southwestward into the Chattahoochee River Valley. And there were already some white settlers in this area at that time, but that really opened this area for more white settlement, even though it was not yet part of Georgia. And then in late 1700s, more and more white settlers uh, and European settlers moved into this area where we're located between the Ogmogee and the Oconee Rivers. And uh, it was still Indian territory then, but they were moving in. In, the in 1795, George Washington formed a commission and he asked them to, to develop a treaty between the Creeks uh, and the United States for the land between the Oconee and the Ogmogee. Before we go into the next little section of our talk, I thought it was important to kind of get a perspective on the population here. By the time the end of the 1700s arrived, there were probably four or 5,000 people living in this area, this roughly this county kind of. So there were, there were a lot of people here already. They were trappers, uh, early settlers, hunters. Uh, I've read about dairies list, you know, uh, being here before it was even a state. And then in 1810 the census, we had 7,500 people. Uh, 10 years later, we, we had doubled our population because we were a frontier town and people were coming here to, um, to settle and to move westward. Population dipped a little bit as the cotton prices dropped and so forth through a glut actually. And then the railroad and, and, a, and a boom in the economy um, through the late 1800s uh, caused us to peak out around 1900, 1910. Uh, a lot of the brick buildings on the square were built about that time, replacing earlier wooden ones. And then in the late 19 teens, the boll weevil arrived from Brownsville, Texas, and decimated the Jasper County population along with that of a lot of other areas around here. And the population dropped in half within a decade. And it dropped uh, a little more until it bottomed out in 1970 at 5,700 people. And now we're headed back up in a pretty steady line and we're at about a little over 13,000 now, probably a little bit more than that in our next census. In the early 19th century, uh, we were um, mapped by surveyors who divided the property into squares that were 202 and a half acres apiece. The lines ran on 45 degree angles um, and they, they came in and they surveyed it and ma they mapped it. And the Treaty of Washington in 1805, um, created a, a treaty between the Creek Indians and the United States, and the land was deeded in the first legal description for land in this area, beginning at the high shoals of the Appalachia, um, up above Monroe somewhere, I think, and to the east bank of the Okafahatchee. I've studied a little bit more to, and learned that that's the Alcove River, and then down to the first branch of the Ogmogee to the Seven Islands to leave the whole of it on the Indian side. So the river bed was stayed on the creek side. And the, uh, the line went down the Ogmogee to where it encountered the Oconee and then back up to the starting point. The Ogmogee old fields were, were not included. A little small area there were, were retained by the creeks. The U.S. provided several million dollars to the creeks along with two blacksmiths and two strikers for eight years. And these three people, if you own land in Jasper County, you can trace your deed back to the one that these three signed, Tuskenaha, Fluco, and Amanthu. So I thought that was interesting. This is the parent deed for all of the land that uh, is in Jasper County. In 1805, McIntosh and then President Thomas Jefferson met and McIntosh described that he was going to improve the road from Monticello to the Coosa River westward for wagon traffic. And in 1805, 1807, this land that had been surveyed out was given to U.S. citizens in a land lottery. Most of them came from the Virginia area to settle this area. And it was, it was an experiment. A land lottery had never been held anywhere else in the world, as far as I know. And they wanted to find out how this might work to distribute land to, the, to their population. 
1807 and 8, uh, Jasper County and Monticello were founded. And then there was a, a small war called the Red Stick War uh, a little west of here that drove the creeks out of Oak Fusky so that the, the, the road through Jasper County that had been, called, had been called several other names um, was no longer called Oak Fusky, but they started calling it the McIntosh Road because McIntosh was so instrumental in getting it started. And in 1819, McIntosh says, I intend on keeping public entertainment for man and horse. And he built stores in ferries and evidently became very rich in doing so. I also read that about this time, the Creek Nation passed a law that said that if someone ceded land, signed, you know, signed an agreement ceding land to the United States without the full agreement of the Creek Nation, that it was a capital offense. And I don't know that this is the way it happened, but Shortly after that, McIntosh was executed on his front porch in his cabin in Carrollton by other Creek Indians. So I guess they carried through the, with their throat. We were a frontier town in 1819. We were the tip of the spear. Right out here on the western edge, there were white settlers in this part of Georgia, but um, it was not legal to go across the river without a permit um, unless you had... Um, permission to do so. But there were still a lot of white settlers out there. And they they had conflicts from, with one another from time to time, obviously. Uh, there were killings and there were thievery and everything else that everybody does all across uh, civilized areas were happening out here in these uncivilized areas. And I guess someone in Georgia determined that there needed to be some jurisdiction for when some of these people were occasionally brought to justice. So they passed uh, a law in 1814 to say that the Jasper County Sheriff and his two deputies probably uh, had jurisdiction over this whole area of Georgia. Obviously, probably didn't do much patrolling out there, but if somebody was caught in that area and brought to justice, they were tried in the Jasper County courts for this seven-year period there between 1814 and 1821. So it was, uh, it was an interesting. The stagecoach era began in the early 1820s and stretched to the um, point just about the time the railroads came through, late 1800s, and it's um, it's a very romantic, romanticized time, even though it's relatively short, and it had a lot of impact on, on the Seven Islands Road being remembered, and this, this is part of the reason why. There was a primary east-west route across Georgia, started over here at the Barksdale's Ferry on the Savannah River, uh, just above Augusta, I believe, and came across Georgia southwestward to the Watley's Ferry on the Chattahoochee River. Along the way, you can see the towns it went through, including Godfrey, Shadedale, Monticello, Indian Springs. And this section of it, from where it crossed the, um, right here is where the, the Appalachia and the Oconee River sort of come together, and it, and it crossed there. And came through Morgan and Jasper counties and crossed at the 40 acre island crossing at the seven islands. Let me say another word about the seven islands. The, there are not that I know of exactly seven islands. Um, at least when I count, I get different numbers, but roughly between Jackson Lake and Highway 83, there are a series of small islands in the Ogmogi. And this series of islands is what gives that general area the name seven islands. So when you hear me say that, that's where it comes from. This was about a 200 mile trip and it probably took about four days minimum. The part through Jasper County was known as the Seven Islands Road because it crossed at those seven islands right there on the old. There were a lot of other routes. This is just one I sketched up from a description I read. Um, there was a, a, is a monument down at the, the house where Sam Goolsby lived and um, it says Hillsboro one direction and Monticello the other. It's got part of it broken off, but there was also a route I know that came through Monticello from the south, uh, coming up Hillsborough Street, and there, there used to be a big inn, stagecoach inn, where our post office sits now, and there was a there was a livery right next to it where the Bank of Monticello drive-through is, taking care of the horses and everything. And reportedly, the stagecoach driver would blow a loud horn when he was quite a distance away, and he would blow it the number of times for the number of passengers he had, so the the cook would know how many meals to prepare for the night. There was also all sorts of stories. This is one uh, written by written down by John Harvey in the 70s. 
He said a, a, a man and woman held up a stagecoach just outside of Monticello and took $5,000 in gold. And the sheriff got in hot pursuit, and they hid the gold, buried it, and took off and got away. And uh, evidently, some of the older citizens in the 70s used to say that as children, they tried to go out on the stagecoach routes and dig and find the gold. But I guess they, if they ever found it. Well, now we're going to talk about uh, more of the geography instead of the history. And we're going to start by talking about local paths of Georgia. First of all, if anybody ever finds this book, I'd like to borrow it or buy it from them. I have not been able to locate it, but I'd like to. Uh, in that book is this map of all these trails throughout Georgia. We're going to zoom center part of it where you can see Monticello is located right here. Uh, for reference purposes, we got Covington and Hillsboro and Augusta over here. Look at, look, at, look at Augusta because you see all these paths. They tend to radiate out of that area. There's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, you could take a, a canoe or a boat northward from the ocean all the way up from Savannah, and this is as far as you could paddle because this is the fall line. So that's an obvious reason why there were settlement here. But uh, it also is sort of in a line from Charleston area, which developed early. And so anyway, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, Indian paths and later roads that radiated from this area. The primary one that most maps uh, call the main east-west path would be the Upper Creek Path, sometimes called the Oak Fusky Path, later called the McIntosh Road, and part of it even the Federal Road. But it, it came from Augusta, and as I said, it passed right through Jasper County, just between Hillsborough and Monticello, and I'll give a little bit more detail about that later. Over here near Sparta somewhere, the Hightower Trail forked off to the north up to a, a a Cherokee um, settlement in northwest Georgia called New Echota. And probably the, t the creek term Etowah probably was, if you say Etowah, uh, it kind of sounds like Hightower a little bit. They say that the term Hightower probably came from the word Etowah. And if you say it with a short I, Etowah, it sounds just like our Indian term Etowah that we use. Um, so both those, both those probably came from that term. Connecting these two major paths was the Seven Islands Road, and that's the one we're going to talk about the most later on, but it is a connector path between two other major paths. So we've talked a lot about Oak Fusky, so where was it? Uh, I said it was on the Tallapoosa River. It's in East Alabama, and so I decided I would uh, plot it on a map and try to figure out exactly where it was and just take a look, and I did that, and I found it right under Lake Martin. So it's no longer accessible unless you're scuba diving. A couple of other old trail maps. This one I want to show in particular because it has a north-south route that is not shown on some of the other maps. And I think this is probably the Tugelo Trail. It's what is listed here uh, that I've read about. It goes from Tugelo up near Tacoa, southward to the Apalachicola Bay, and goes through Jasper County, uh, just on the east side of the Old Mogi. This trail um, from another one of the writings shows very prominently the Upper Creek Path. Um, it shows the High Tower Trail. It shows the Seven Islands Road connecting the two. It shows lots of other paths. Uh, pay attention to this one's Cusada Trail. Uh, I'll mention it again in a minute. The maps that I used to get started on this adventure 20 years ago and the ones that I used uh, as reference points in, in looking for the trail recently, again, were, were, were created in 1803. And th there's a lot more on those maps than just the Seven Islands Road. And I want to point out some of those other maps, some of those other roads before I uh, go into more de de detail about the one we're here to talk about. There's the Seven Islands Road roughly through Jasper County. And right up here, there's a spur off of it. Um, and it, um, it, it's, it crosses, um, we don't know who the latest was, and we're not sure where this road goes, but it probably went up and, and formed an alternate crossing of Murder Creek up here, um, is my best guess. The Upper Creek Path, we've talked about a couple of times. It went across the state east-west from Augusta to Oak Fusky and back, and, um, it basically came across Murder Creek 
near the county line, crossed over Aptimus Road, traced along Smithboro Road, followed Bragg Road, crossed Goolsby Road right there at, um, at the Brook Hollow subdivision, crossed Cedar Creek, probably along Felspar Road, maybe along Fredonia Church down to McElhaney's Crossroads, and then took some dirt roads all the way and crossed the Old Mogi at the same place that the Seven Islands Road did. So that was that was a older and less important trail during colon colonial and early state times, but it was probably a bigger trail in the past than the Seven Islands Road. The path through Hillsboro, uh, it's just called Path on the map. I don't know where it went or where it came from, but it looks to me like it went down Sugar Hill Road to Macon direction and then along Fullerton Phillips and Goolsby to Milledgeville. Rock Eagle Path is probably the Cusada Trail. Um, it took off from the Upper Creek Path right near the Optimist Road and went northward across Murder Creek, followed the current location of Bullard Road for a while and then bent to the east and went along what's now Rock Eagle Road, probably to the Rock Eagle area, I would guess. The Tugelo Trail, uh, is that, that's the one I mentioned that was running north-south in that map I showed you. And there is a road where, the, where this orange line is in 1803 through Jasper County, right along the east side of the Ogmogee up through Prospect and northward on the Highway 11 Ridge. I, I don't know if it was the same road as the Tugelo Trail, but it, it's possible that it was. Sometimes these trails just run out, like right here it just stops, like suds. And that's because this surveyor that surveyed the south west side of Jasper County just didn't map it and this survey up here did map it so we don't know where it goes through the south part. I want to share with you some of the tricks and tools that I developed as I began to look for these roads and find out how to search for them. The best tool we've got as I mentioned are these maps. They were created using the best surveying equipment available in 1803 they were done methodically according to a set of specs and probably even more importantly we can match these maps with a high, high level of accuracy to maps that we have today which makes them very important and you can see here they've they've shown the seven islands road through here uh, they show the creeks and uh, big trees that they encounter on the property lines this is a notebook from one of the early surveyors they were um, directed by the surveyor general to note proper places, runs of water, and noted old paths or roads. And you can see they, they'd start from a corner and they'd work down one of these lines and they'd give a distance and then to show that there was a branch crossing the line. And they would even show what direction the branch flowed across it, um, so forth. One point over here, I saw the Casada tra Trail um, and a path. And here's a path crossing. So. This is what the notes look like, and we would love to have more of them. Unfortunately, uh, most of them have been lost or destroyed. The man-made features that we use. Roadbeds are the most obvious, and as I mentioned before, we're not finding paths that were created by people that were walking here 4,000 years ago. They, they probably just did not leave enough of a trace. They probably did not disturb the earth enough for water to wash away those disturbed sediments and lower the roadbed in a way that wagons and horses and cattle did at a later date. But those roads that were formed a long time ago, and those paths and trails, uh, eventually had that wagon traffic and they lowered as the rain and storms would wash away water that was, that was loosened by the traffic on the road and particularly in areas where there's a slope to the road is where you see the, the, the deeper road beds. When the lottery was held and even pre-lottery, uh, the settlers would preferentially settle around these paths and trails because they wanted a way to get to other settlements and take their goods to market and so forth. So you would expect to find a lot more very early settlements along these roads than than you would in an area that didn't have any of them. So that's another thing to look for as we as we search. There are also natural features that that indicate um, presence of roads and that we can look for. If you've ever seen an oak tree like this shaped with this 
round, large crown. And if you've ever encountered one of those in the middle of a of woods, you know that oak tree grew and formed when it, there were no other trees around it. It was out in the middle of a field. And for most of our hi history, almost every cultivatable acre that was available and, and good upland pasture was cleared. So you're not going to find an oak tree like this out in the middle of a cotton field. The oak trees like this would have been around house sites, cemeteries, along property lines maybe, and along roads. And so if you see a tree like this, there was there's something there other than just open pasture and, and it's a hint that you need to look a little closer. Rows of cedars are a good indicator. Uh, the cedar waxwing eats the berries from cedars and sits on fence lines and cemetery fences and clothes lines around houses and their droppings have these uh, cedar seeds in them and uh, so you see a lot of old cedar trees around these features and I've also read that when a berry goes through the digestive system of a cedar waxwing it's a lot more likely to sprout so that's another reason that you see cedars preferentially around all these old settlement areas. The last thing I'll mention is that you just need to get out there and walk around and look for yourself where you think a road went and determine where would they have gone, where, where would they have taken a wagon, or where would they have walked. And sometimes you can see obvious things that they would have avoided, swamps and steep slopes and so forth. I saw this gully in one spot and it was, you know, a 10 foot deep gully. And um, I thought, well, they, they wouldn't have come through here because of this gully. And then I realized that this tree is almost out in the middle of the gully. And this tree is probably almost 100 years old. So 100 years ago, there was not a gully here. So again, there's no there's no substitute for just being. Now we get to the uh, the fun part, I guess you'd say. We're going to take a little tour across Jasper County and go into a lot more detail about where the route is through our county. We're going to talk about some of the things that are along the side of the road. Some of those are directly tied to the road. Others are just points of interest that that you might want to hear about. And uh, we'll start up in Morgan County. And if you're familiar with Godfrey, you know that coming from the northeast, there's a, a prominent paved road that has a big historical marker on it that says Seven Islands Road. And it's, it's called Seven Islands Road. And it came from the high shoals of the Appalachia. Westward, southwestward from Godfrey, there's a prominent ridge that today has a railroad line on it. Uh, that didn't get there until 1890, but the trail was along that same ridge. And when they got to a, right in here, they needed to cross the little river. And so they found a spot where the high ground went fair distance out into the floodplain of the little river. And the, flood, the little river has a lot of marshes, swamps. It's, it's a wide floodplain and very difficult crossing. And I started looking at aerial photographs on the west side, trying to figure where, where would the road have gone over here. And I saw an obvious uh, indication of of some feature over here. So I went out and scouted it out. And sure enough, I found an old roadbed here with uh, large trees. It's, it's, there's no doubt. And here's here's a picture of the roadbed looking uh, southward. Um, it's it's well-traveled and it's got open pasture on both sides and, and large, pretty large trees in it. And then the route goes over the hill and comes down and, and crosses Gap Creek, which was a pretty prominent, prominent um, here's Gap Creek on the map running. You cross it when you cross Highway 83 there. Somewhere down around the crossing of Gap Creek, or not, I'm not certain where, was a little village called Winds Crossing. And it, it's mentioned in some of the text I read. Uh, here it says that uh, um, going west, people stopped in Monticello at Winds Crossing on Seven Islands Road uh, to provision for their trip to Alabama, Mississippi. And then down here, you can see a picture that's got a lot of the Wynn brothers that evidently it was their ancestors that that lived at Wynn's. Uh, the Tucker, uh, Mr. T.C. Tucker is also in the picture, and this is Tucker property today. So uh, I've also read that when the railroad came through Shaderdale in the 1880s, I guess, uh, a lot of the shops and residents of Wynn's Crossing moved sh a short distance southward to Shaderdale. When the road crosses Gap Creek and comes up the hill here, uh, it, it, it's very prominent. There's no way you can miss it. It's, it's, it's become a landlocked line and it is, is deep and very well established. And down here you can see it goes right through the center of where the old castle facility is located today, just for a point of reference there. Out of old castle area, it heads southwest right along the route that the engineers 
uh, chose for the railroad and for Highway 83. That's no secret and uh, no uh, coincidence. That's a very broad, um, easy to travel ridge, and that's where the road went. When they when the road got to Shadydale in the early 1813s, uh, there was a cabin that was used to house travelers and so forth. It grew over time into a stagecoach stop and eventually in the 20th century became known as the Shadydale Hotel, which you see a, a, a nice picture of here. And just pay attention here to this grist mill uh, sitting out, stone sitting out front of it. That's the grist mill stone and it's still there today. It's got um, a bronze plaque on the front set in 1940 by the Daughters of the American Revolution that says this marks the end of the old stagecoach route from Barksdale's Ferry on the Savannah River to Whatley's Ferry on the Chattahoochee, which we showed you a little while ago. There's also a well in Shadedale with a stagecoach stop sign on it. Uh, reportedly, one of the wealthiest men in all of the Southeast lived in Shadedale at, at that time and owned that hotel and, and reportedly Sh Sherman stayed in the hotel when he was traveling through uh, Georgia in the 1860s. Coming out of south, uh, southwest side of Shadedale, I could not find any evidence of the route through here. It probably has been disturbed by cultivation over the years and, and probably didn't leave much of a mark to start with because it's high ground. It crosses the railroad right through here and then down here it crosses Banks Kelly Road heading southward across these planted pines toward Murder Creek. Murder Creek is a wide creek with a lot of floodplain and wetlands. So they found the spot where the high ground came as close to the creek as they could. And that you can easily see that's also where they've planted these planted pines uh, in recent decades. And that's pretty near the current crossing where there's a bridge here, a concrete bridge. And over on, the, on this side of the road, uh, I found good ditches, nice rounded crown. Uh, with, this shape probably was formed, you know, as the late 19th, early 20th century started, but there's a very good chance this was the original path that evolved into that road. And the road came on up pretty much parallel King Plow Road until right here. And take note of this point, because at this point, the ridge, continues along King Plow Road, but the old Seven Islands path veered southward and went down across this creek bottom. Right down here on the other side of the creek, which is now a lake, we found roadbed. It's in a soil that is very erodible, and so it, it's, it's dug quite deep over the years, and it's uh, very well established. And across the lake on the north side, I found another very good roadbed. And it didn't take much study to figure out that that was Latus's road. Uh, if you remember, I said there was a little fork here. And it's got a, another little spur coming off of it in that direction. And probably came right up here and crossed uh, at Murder Creek somewhere. I don't know who Latus was. Maybe we can find out. The road is, if, if, if you can call a roadbed gorgeous, these road beds are, road beds are gorgeous. They're, they're, they're square and very well established and maintained. And if these roads were anywhere near this condition in 1803 when they were first mapped, then there, there had been a lot of traffic there for a long time. And that would have been an interesting thing to find. Uh, here's it written on the maps, L-A-T-U-S apostrophe S, I think. But you can see how it forks off from the Seven Islands Road, which is down here. At the top of that hill, south of the lake, there was a house site that I was talking about. It's got a beautiful magnolia in, uh, around the house site and a very deep well. I threw a walnut down the well and it took four or five seconds for it to hit bottom. So it was it, you wouldn't want to fall down that, that well. Uh, it looked like the brick foundation and, and chimney of the house. It w was not made of rock like a lot of the ones we found. There's a plat of this area made in 1933. Uh, when the Shaws first purchased the property. And it clearly shows this straight Latus's road. So it was uh, it was in use then, probably as a farm road. And there is a road that crosses right along in here, uh, across the dam and heads up this direction toward all these houses. And that, that could have been a remnant of the Seven Islands Road in 1933, possibly. There's a lot of houses down here too. So it was a pretty active agricultural area. So as the route 
head southwestward, it's got to deal with Blackwell Creek. And Blackwell Creek is perhaps even more uh, wetlands and wide floodplain than Murder Creek in some areas. And they couldn't just cross it uh, wherever they wanted. And they so they kind of paralleled it for a while. And they had to cross these little tributaries. And it, it's, it's up and down and up and down through here. It's kind of a rough, rough ride if you're in a wagon. And I found a house site right here on top of this little bluff. And then it appears the road probably went um, along this area where later there was County Road number 66, which has been abandoned now, but it's a hunting road now. But uh, there's a good chance that County Road 66 was in the same location as the original path. I found the road roadbed over here on the west side of Blackwell Creek at Post Road. And um, so I finally figured out where they crossed there. And you can't see the crossing out in the swamp, but once they get near Post Road, you can see the old roadbed right through there. When I was scouting, I found um, I found another roadbed that I could not resist chasing till its end, and and I went southward on it and waded across Blackwell Creek to the top of the next hill, where I found uh, another house site with this well-preserved chimney. And um, uh, these chimneys, I, I don't know if the the rock construction is indicative of their age. It, it, it seems to me that the, the rock might mean that it's older than if it's brick. But I don't know that for sure. But I would like to learn how to age the, age these using analysis of the mortar or construction techniques or whatever is available, just to find out how old these are when you when you find them out in the woods. Hopewell Church is located pretty near the trail, and it's it's uh, circa 1830s, I think. So it was uh, among the first areas settled, and it's got the Blackwell Cemetery there. There were a lot of Blackwells in this area of the. As we head down southwestward along the side of Post Road, we crossed West Blackwell Road, and we couldn't find the route in this area. It's again, it's upland, been cultivated. Right up here on the north side of Blackwell Road is uh, the Malone House, where B.G. Malone grew up, and um, this was in 1948, so it's pretty recent by these standards. And you can see there's people still cultivating and picking cotton out in front of the house. One of these folks is Johnny Malone, who uh, served for many years as a um, distinguished deputy sheriff for Jasper County. Um, evidently, he's been identified as, as one of the folks that, that helped farm this area in the 1940s. So as I was looking around over here, I still couldn't find the Seven Islands Road, but I found a house site right up here on top of this hardwood hillside. A more dilapidated, but still um, a nicely constructed chimney. It looks like this mortar is... Uh, is made of, of red clay almost. So I don't know if that uh, indicates anything about the age or not, but it looks like. And right beside that house, I found a little road, a little driveway of some sort heading southwest, and I followed it, and lo and behold, I found the Seven Islands stagecoach uh, route again, the Seven Islands Road. And right at the bottom of the hill, it crosses Lowry Branch at a rock. There's a ford here. And again, this, it's not coincidence that they, they chose this carefully, I'm sure, because it was much easier to cross than a than a muddy um, a muddy creek bed. Even though Lowry Branch is not that large, it still would have been much, much easier to cross by foot or wagon at this location than, than most of the other. So it came around this hilltop, don't know exactly where, I couldn't find it, and then picked it up again, heading up Calvin Road, where it crosses about right here. And this is what the road looks like there. And there was a beautiful patch of Joe Powell weed there uh, on the side of Calvin Road, a uh, tenth of an acre or more of it. And it had thousands of butterflies and bees buzzing around. It was really in August. So the road crosses this little driveway, goes across this little upland patch. And there's a house site right here that probably, you know, was established and lived in while that road was being used. And found the roadbed again as it crossed down this fence line and around this little pond and around the head of the spring. This spring um, rock work might not be that old, but I can almost be certain that these travelers that were headed through here for thousands of years and, and even more recently would have stopped at the spring to get water because it's a very bold spring and it's you don't have to go way down to the creek to get water. It's right up here on the on the side of the hill. Just past the spring, there's a there's a very prominent row of cedar trees, and I don't I don't know if those cedar trees are uh, remnants of a of a road or 
on a road bank, but I couldn't find where they'd ever been on a property line there. So there was some reason those were in a line in that location, and it could have been because they were along the road. There's a cemetery right here that's got several popes buried in it. This is a picture of that row of cedars that I was telling you about, and uh, the popes were buried there in the 1880s. This cedar tree is probably a 36 inch cedar. It's huge, and I'd like to go out and, and age that tree and see how old it is. As the road crosses um, Palo Alto Road, it goes across the pecan orchard and across Highway 11 and heads back down toward the dirt road that we today uh, call Seven Islands Road. And Seven Islands Road is nice and straight, you can see in this area. But my mapping and I didn't find any remnants of the road here, but everything indicates that this path was sort of a wavy path through this area. So the question is, you know, why is the path wavy, but the, the modern day road is straight? And the answer is that it, the modern day road is on a landlot line. Remember those lines that were dividing these landlots uh, for early settlers? And that's where one of them was located. And you can very easily on this aerial photograph still see evidence of it. And if you look 2,970 feet each direction, you'll see two more. And you can do this all over the county, and that's the way you take these old maps and accurately locate them on the, onto the new maps. Is you can go out and find many of these landlocked corners on the ground and survey them. As the road came back, um, it crosses uh, the little airport we've got, Mr. Garvey's airport, and came along the south side of Seven Islands Road. There's a, a nicely uh, preserved. Road. And at the top of the hill is the Mentor House was built uh, about 1815, 1817 by Richard and Nancy Mentor from Chatham County, North Carolina. And reportedly they designed and built the house based on houses they'd seen in Georgetown and Philadelphia in their travels. Uh, this is some of the rock terrace out front. Uh, bees have made their home in one of the old windows that was taken reportedly in the late 1800s of, of the mentor house and um, there's a tree out front cedar tree right here and I I found the tree and it's a lot bigger than that now and it's mostly dead and the tops broken out of it but I aged it with a incremental borer borer and found that it sprouted uh, in 1810 about the time that the house was built which was a pretty interesting across the the Seven Islands Road of today and the Seven Islands Road of years past is a, is a grave site that might have some of the mentors buried there. Um, Benny and I found it sort of to Mr. Junior Banks, who lives right next to the mentor house. And he kept telling us there was a, a graveyard across the road. And, and Benny said, yeah, I know. I know where the graveyard is up here. We're going to go look at it next. And Mr. Banks said, no, there's a tomb down here. And he pointed down to a different direction. And we, we went down the hill across the road and we found this grave site uh, not too far back in the woods and have no idea who it was. It could have been um, the mentors, but it, it looks like the other graves that we found that were early 1800s. So don't know who that is. A little higher on the road, we found the cemetery that Benny was already familiar with. And it has Richard and Nancy Mentor has their headstone here. And Benny assisted in getting this headstone established uh, with the help of one of the the mentor relatives, and um, he's not 100% sure that they put the headstone on the right on the right grave, but uh, evidently the lady who was helping him must have known where they were buried. Across the uh, road, between the old roadbed of the Seven Islands Road and the current Seven Islands Road, is the Smith House or the Stone Smith House. It's owned by Stan Sam Smith now. In the early to mid 1800s. Originally, I think, as a two-room two room building that was added on and, and expanded into this beautiful house that we have today. Uh, in the backyard of it, I found an old oak tree right near the roadbed, and I, I, I aged the tree to roughly 1860, which is, is just a, a young thing compared to some of these other things that we're mentioning. Uh, there's boxwoods along the old roadbed back there, and they're, they obviously are decorative shrubs, and I don't know how old boxwoods live, but... These seem to be at least 100 years old or more because I don't think this road has been in use in quite a long time. One other interesting fact is that um, the man you all probably know, um, uh, Pooch Marion Stone, uh, was born in this house. I don't know the year, but I, I read that he was the first cesarean section in Jasper County. 
and the doctor, one of the doctors that came down from Atlanta um, to uh, perform the surgery was named Marion. And so that's probably where Marion Stone got his name. As the road crosses Highway 212, it goes uh, over the site of the Mennonite Church, across Seven Islands Road of today, across Gilbert Road, and heads back down toward Harvey Lane Road. And right out in the middle of the pasture here, um, kind of not right next to a road, is the Gibson Cemetery. And I feel pretty sure that the old road must have gone by the cemetery. It would be that far from an existing road. Um, this is the oldest grave that Benny has found um, in his searches of graves throughout Jasper County. There was a, a young child buried here in 1813, which was just six years after Jasper County was founded. Heading on south, um, many of you remember not too long ago, Harvey Lane's barn was located at this intersection right on the old road route. Um, it's too bad that's gone. That was a beautiful old barn. Right across the road is the Florino House. I've read that when Sherman's troops came through, some of the officers stayed here. And they, uh, they took lots of his livestock, lots of his equipment. After the war, he filed... Um, a request you know you could file a request for restoration of the value that the soldiers took if you could prove that you were not uh, supportive of the rebel cause and that you were trying to um, trying to help the federal cause and they'd give you your money back and he filed over a hundred thousand dollars of claims and uh, reportedly never got any of it back fierce cemetery is a little bit further down clay road and it's got a revolutionary war a veteran buried there, William Fears. The road cuts across here. I didn't have time to really look in this area and didn't find it, but it, we did find it where it showed back up at Clay Road and kind of zigzags back and forth with Clay Road in this area. It approaches Lane Road, and as best I can tell, the route pretty much follows where Lane Road is today. There's a, there's a good ridge there with lots of terraces and um, right down here after crossing this little creek, the road sort of has to go around this hill to, to climb up the hill. Uh, they would never have been able to go straight up this steep spot. There was a church, uh, excuse me, uh, there was a school here on top of the hill that reportedly was burned when the troops came through in 64. Across the road was the, is the Tyler Dozier Cemetery that's not in very good shape today, but there's, there's quite a number of graves and some wrought iron over in that cemetery. I knew I would learn a lot when I when I started this recent exercise of learning more about Seven Islands Road. But one of the things I did not expect to learn was this next part. The Seven Islands Stagecoach Route was not in most of Jasper County on the Seven Islands Road. It took a different route. And it was, it was called the Seven Islands Stagecoach Route because it crossed at the Seven Islands of the, the Ogmulgee. And part of it was on the, on the Seven Islands Road, but um, those two are, are different things. And I'm going to explain how I, I discovered that. Right up here where the route comes out of Shadydale, you remember that I mentioned that the road veered off of the ridge at King Plow Road. Well, this is the route that Seven Islands Road and Seven Islands Path took. And across Jasper County, there are nine places where there are significant creek crossings to get from King Plow Road to 40 Acre Island on the Old Mogi. That would have been a rough buggy ride. And if I were, if I owned a company that wanted to um, take people across Georgia, I'd try to be avoiding these creeks if I could, if I wanted them to pay uh, me to take them across Georgia a second time. So I wanted to find a more smooth route. I found these maps showing the route going through Palo Alto and then bending down Highway 11 and through Bethel and over toward Highway 16. And then I, I began to read more about uh, the route following the, the ridges along through Palo Alto and Highway 11. And I realized that they would want to avoid these creek crossings if they could. So what they did, uh, they veered off of the Seven Islands Road route and by that time, by the time the stagecoaches started to run, there were lots of other roads available. So they took a route that went right along King Plow Road, 
um, along Liberty Church, probably through Palo Alto, down Highway 11, on the Bethel Church Road, over to Highway 16, and down Con by Concord Church and Smithboro Road, and crossed probably somewhere near 40 Acre Island. To get from King Plow Road to the river on this alternate route, there was not one single creek crossing. The whole route is a ridge. So it made perfect sense that they would have chosen that route. There's some proof also. The Isaac Parker Inn was located here near Palo Alto. You can see on, in this poor picture, there's a stagecoach, uh, excuse me, there is a gristmill stone, very similar to the one we found in Shadydale, erected two years later by DAR. And it marks the site of the Isaac Parker Inn, which was a stagecoach stop on that same uh, stagecoach route across the state of Georgia. And it says via Rock Mountain. I don't know where that is, but if any of you know, I'd like to, to learn more about it later. Isaac Parker's daughter married a Thomason, who was reportedly works also for the stagecoach company and also um, has relatives in Jasper County. A little further down the route, uh, a lot of you might be familiar with the old Bethel store located here at Seven Islands Road and Bethel Church Road. Picture taken at the store on Bethel Church Road, which runs right here. This was taken in 1913, quite a while probably after the stagecoach stopped running, but still has uh, ladies sitting in, in coaches and a couple guys playing checkers apparently right here and then a guy on a horse over here. Um, it'd be really fascinating to know who these people are. We do. Um, evidently, Benny met with um, Mr. Stone, I guess, or uh, and and they sat down and they they identified as many as Mr. Stone knew, um, and even added one after the fact, Mr. Oscar Price over here. But um, we're we have almost everybody. Here they are. The route came on down Bethel Church Road along Highway 16, and then turned uh, at what would have been the Faulkner Farm at the time, turned on to Concord Church Road uh, at Concord Church. This is um, an old church. I don't know a lot about it, but it's certainly early 1800s uh, vintage church that's been greatly restored and preserved. And it's, it's really beautiful. And um, a lot of grave sites around it. So that's, that's the alternate route. Um, that does not follow the Seven Islands Road. After the after Lane Road gets here to Smith Mill, we found the roadbed headed southwest across this power line and creek. Very, very good roadbed right through here. You can't miss it. It goes through a hunting camp. And then uh, we found an interesting feature here right in the center of the road, the Seven Islands Toilet and I thought that was worth mentioning since it was right in the center of the Seven Islands Road and most of them probably don't even know uh, where they are when they're sitting on that thing. Right up here on top of the uh, ridge is an old house site with a well and some foundation stones. Probably was the last house many travelers saw before they headed west and crossed the border of the United States right here down the bottom of the hill. This is where I think the stagecoach route came in uh, to go down to the river. It might have crossed at some of the other ferries too. It could have possibly crossed at Smith Mill or Lamar's Ferry down below. But if they crossed at 40 Acre Island, this is where it would have come in along this ridge. The road comes on down around the curve and I really uh, identified it easily down through this area after, after some searching. After I found it, it was pretty obvious, but it took a while. There's one little neck right in here where it, it, would, just, it would have been just about impossible for anybody to travel anywhere through this area except for this spot because it's a narrow ridge that falls 30 feet on each side. So it funnels everything right through this spot. And then as you get to this curve uh, down to the riverbed, it, it gets steep. Something like this. And this doesn't look that steep in the photo, but it, it's, it is. It's probably 5 or 6%, which is steep for a dirt road, maybe 7 or 8%. And in 64, when the federal troops crossed from Butts County into Jasper County at 40 Acre Island. It was November 19th. It had been raining reportedly for several days and it was raining the day they crossed. And it actually took them three days to get completely across. And up this hill, they 
they got stuck in the mud and, and there became a, a real traffic jam with these 2,000 ambulances and 4,000 head of cattle and, or excuse me, 400 head of cattle, um, 30,000 men over three days and it just became a quagmire and evidently they even had one ammunition wagon that was stuck somewhere on this on this incline and and instead of leaving it for rebel forces they, they blew it up before they left but I think it would look something like this uh, at the time it was wide open fields like this and just a quagmire of people pulling horses and wagons and cannons all stuck in the mud this is actually a World War One photo I think based on the the helmets and one or two vehicles here but I, th I think this gives you an indication of what it probably looked like that day in, in November as they were trying to get out of the Old Mogi River base. So we arrive at the bottom of the hill at the Jasper County line which is the east side of the river and uh, this is 40 acre island all along this area uh, these are the shoals that I'll tell you about in a minute and uh, to get a better idea about where this is in Jasper Show you on a couple of other maps. It's it's roughly halfway between 16 and 83 um, on the Ogamoyu River, right about here. And if you're in a straight line from Monticello to Indian Springs, it's rough, roughly on that line as well. It gives you just kind of a better perspective. Um, above 40 Acre Island from a, from a drone, when I took this picture. You can see Jackson Lake in the far distance here. Smith Mill Road comes in probably what half mile north of 40 Acre Island. You can see the pastures here that the Holloways have have cleared. Wise Creek comes in from the east right at this bend in the river and then right around the bend not too far is Nelson Island. I think that's probably Nelson Island right there. It's another mile or two or three down uh, to Highway 83. It's a, it's a long way down there. This is without a doubt in my mind, the prettiest area of the Old Mogi River, from the Alcove all the way to the Altamaha, it's just beautiful right here. There's a lot of shoals. There's uh, it's wide. It's got islands. Um, if you remember our geology lesson from a while back, well, here you go. These rocks dip southward at about 30 to 40 degrees, and the northern edge of them is running northeast to southwest perpendicular with the flow of the river and when the river gets to these rock the edge of those layers of old rocks formed in the bottom of an ocean they can't cut through them so they 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 the river spreads out and exposes the tops of the rocks as it trickles over them in a wide path there and that formation and and these rocks is the reason that we have the seven islands crossing and all these ancient trails and it's probably also the reason for the, the seven islands themselves as as sediment accumulates behind these um, these formations as the river carries sediment down the river and, and islands are formed. This is what the seven islands um, crossing looks like at 40 Acre Island. These are the ends of those sedimentary layers that are exposed. And um, I thought I'd read this. this. This has some interesting parts in it. This is written by Clara Thomas. Thomason Ellis. Remember the Thomasons that married the daughter of Isaac Parker? Well, she's a descendant of those folks. And she says, those of us who grew up at the islands knew of this phenomenon. At a certain times of the day, the level of the river would drop drastically. That was probably when they were running the mill races or something like that upstream. So much that if you knew when it happened, you could walk across the river to the upper tip of the big island and then across the other arm of the river to Butts County side and hardly get your feet wet. When I was about 12 years old, my father showed me how to do it. I envisioned the father out there showing his young daughter how to cross these rocks and I immediately said, well, I've got to go try that because if, if they can do it, I, I certainly can give it a shot. So I recruited a couple of guys. Um, it was Brian Pace from my office who loves to be outside and I have a good friend from Gordon College. He's a professor in physics named Chad Davies, Dr. Chad Davies. And they went with me and we hiked in here and we started seeking a way across the river on foot. And we went up around this pool and we found uh, a pretty easy crossing here over the first uh, channel on the east side of the island like this. And it's, it's really pretty and it was a beautiful day. And we easily found a way to hop, hopscotch across the river here. 
wide. We got on the island. We, we headed south. And across the island, there are pretty big channels that have some flow in them, and they have a lot more flow, I'm sure. But these um, ends of this rock foundation were very easy to cross on by those little creeks. But when you get to the, the northeast side of the river, it, it's a pretty it's two tenths of a mile across there, and you're looking across to the trees on the other side, thinking, "How in the world am I going to walk across this river?" And we just gradually started exploring these little lines of rocks, and we'd go out one until it ran into a dead end, and we'd turn around and try another one until we found a couple of primary routes that could have easily been well-used uh, foot crossings of the river. Before I leave this slide, I just want to point out how beautiful this area is. Um, it's really pretty. It's, it's remote, so not many people see it unless you're floating in the river in a, in a canoe. This is an example looking southward from uh, the flat water above the rapids. It shows Chad Davies, my friend from Gordon, and he's he's scouting one of these crossings, and um, he's stepping mainly on dry rock. And once in a while, you know, he he gets to a point where he has to go ankle deep. But for the most part, he gets across this without getting very wet. And uh, it's a good example of how that could be done. Here's the shoals from the from above, showing you the two places we think that people most likely cross by foot. Could have been others, but uh, this one up here, if you start from the west side and head east, it looks like you can mostly hop and skip across these dry rocks without too much trouble. Uh, right in here, you probably have to to figure out a way to get your feet wet a little bit, and then you can follow these rocks up this way and get over on this little aisle and then hop across that channel and another channel on the other side of it and you're across the river. Uh, it's by far easier than swimming across a, um, a deep, strong flowing river with the pack on your back. So that's the way they did it. When we were out scouting out these um, these cro these foot crossings, we found spikes driven into the rocks. Actually, they weren't driven in; they were there were holes bored in the rocks, and these spikes were driven in the holes. That very well established. And we later figured out, as we discovered the mill race and, and mill on the other side of the river, that these must have been used to hold baffles to divert water into this mill race. It looks like it captured at least half the river here, maybe even more that we didn't find. Here are some of the spikes. They're, they're big, strong steel spikes. Um, the water was channeled around these rocks and into a mill race that probably started right in here. There's Brian sitting on the, uh, the waterfall. The mill race um, in this particular location is not terribly long. Uh, reportedly, the, there's one in this area that was a, a mile long and the longest one in the United States at one time. But the mill race, beautiful rock work. It's uh, it's got arches, steps. Um, I don't think most of this probably had a lot of function. It was just it was just beautiful work. They were proud of what they were building and they they wanted it to look nice. This is a picture of the uh, side of one of the mill races headed down and down here not too far or Lamar Mill. I'm not sure which. Um, it's got very interesting medieval looking features. This is would have been the foundation of the main mill, mill building, I think, and probably that would have been one or two stories of wooden structure above this that housed the machinery and so forth. And somebody's built a deck on it now, but it's uh, it, it's it's very well preserved foundation. Uh, this mill was burned by the troops when they came through in '64, but it was it was reconstructed and used afterwards, uh, from what I understand. 
this would have been um, a channel taking water from the mill race over to the mill to from the paddles. More features. This this is a cemetery. Excuse me. This is a chimney from a nearby house that some officers evidently slept in and did not burn. And I think this house uh, stood until a few decades ago. So where where did the troops cross? We know where people crossed uh, on foot, but they couldn't have carried wagons across all these rocks, and horses would have never made it. And um, there was probably a ferry here, but that didn't have any capacity for 30,000 people. So they used pontoons. And based on these maps and, and using common sense, coming from the west, you can see the, this building here. That's, that's the mill foundation I showed you. You can also see it on this, this map. The, they turned northward for a short distance and put two ponto pontoons in that flat water section that I showed you earlier. And they crossed on the two pontoons and gathered back together on 40 Acre Island and then crossed the little channel on the east side and headed up the hill eventually to Smith's Mill Road. Over here, you can see the same, same path. Uh, they crossed on the pontoons, crossed the island. This even shows the channel through the middle of the island. And then remember that little curve down by the riverbank? I think that's this curve where they encountered the steep hill. And up here at the top of the hill, this is where the house site would have been and the Seven Islands stagecoach route would have come in from the north possibly. And then up to Smith Mill. Uh, the road was so so crowded when they, when they traversed through this area that they originally all planned to go to Gordon. But Blair's 17th Corps got to Smith Mill and realized that it was, uh, it was just too congested in that route. So they went straight and would have gone up Lane Road, roughly through Clay Road, somewhere along Highway 16 into Monticello and then down Jordan Road to, uh, to Gordon. So the pontoons were here, we think. There were two of them, we're sure of that based on the writings we've read. This is what they would have looked like. Uh, this is not the one on the Omogi, but they were wooden boats with a platform uh, crossing them. And reportedly the one for the Ogmulgee crossing was two lanes wide. So they would have put two of these platforms together. And I just can't imagine how you would get 400 cows across a bridge like this, um, not to mention all of the equipment and people and so forth. They also killed a lot of animals at the crossing. Uh, they had a lot of animals reportedly that were worn out and, and, and they didn't want to leave them for the rebels and, the, and for the population to use. So they killed them and dumped them on the south end of 40 Acre Island. And reportedly for years after that, you could find bones and things uh, down on that part of the island. With um, something that was written by a soldier in the 92nd Illinois Mounted Infantry as they were preparing to cross the river. And I think it's a it's a nice way to finish because it kind of sums up the scene that would have been happening that night. On the 19th of November, marched at 1 a.m., raining hard and dark as a pocket, crossed the Ogmogi on the pontoons at Planters Factory, where 200 girls were, were employed making cotton cloth for the rebel army. Great fires were kept blazing on both banks of the river to light up the bridge. The light was so bright that it reflected the factory and the trees upon the banks and the crossing columns of troops in the water as clearly and distinctly as if the river had been a mirror. Um, that, that paints quite a picture and it would have been um, an amazing thing to see. This amazing spot where people have been crossing for millennia uh, to move back and forth across this area of the United States. I appreciate your attention and I hope you learned something and I hope you had as much fun watching it as I did making it because it was uh, it was a good time. Thank you.